Chapter 6 of our AIS textbook talks about how to transform data. So this is the second part of the ETL process. But now we're going to dive in a bit deeper and kind of see what are some of the transformations we might have to do with our data files. So what are the outcomes of this chapter? We're going to learn how to aggregate data, join data, and pivot data. We'll also talk about a lot of different problems with parsing data, getting data in the right format. So this might include concatenating and putting data together, fixing things in the wrong place, fixing and formatting, making things consistent, and standardizing information. We'll also talk a little bit about how to diagnose the problems of data duplication, filtering, contradiction, and other kind of data entry errors. And we'll just talk about, in general, some tracing versus vouching, which is basically accounting's way of verifying information. Now, what should data look like? So we have a couple of terms here. And you don't have to memorize these, but you should just kind of be generally familiar with it and be able to recognize it. Right? Data should be correct. It shouldn't leave out critical information. One of the big problems we have is consistency. As you look at historical data that encompasses more than one quarter or more than one year, you'll find that things shift over time as so you might have to fix information. When you deal with systems, dealing with timely data is important as well. This is figuring out how to get data processed in the right format and to decision makers as quickly as it can in order to make them have proper information. And then also valid, like does stuff actually measure what it's supposed to measure? So structuring. There's a couple of different problems we have with the structure of data that we might have to fix with information. A good way of thinking about it are these sort of three pieces here. We have aggregation, joining, and pivoting. So let's do each one. So aggregation. Aggregation basically means how to summarize information. So this is an example of having data at too detailed of a level. Say, for example, you're looking at a point of sale system. The point of sale system has every single individual item that's sold. Maybe what we really want, though, is a count of how many customers we have. So we'd have to process the data to transform it from individual items into individual customers. Data joining is how we combine two different places. So say that we've done the point of sale system. We have information per customer. Now we want to join it with other information, perhaps like a reward program. So you might want to include that data with your analysis. And then pivoting is sort of what's called rotating. We kind of change the data from what might be a wide format to a tall format. We'll give you some examples here. So let's look at aggregation. So in aggregation, on the left, you see we've got a row for every single vendor. So we have Black & Decker, Califon, and so forth, versus on the right, it's aggregated for all vendors. We also can look at pivoting. Oftentimes, in accounting information, we, we look at financial statements that are already kind of in this wide format. So we have our product category for Black & Decker, and we can see we have product one category, product two category, and so forth. But the idea is the information goes across. So we have the same kind of information. We have a value, but that value is applied to multiple periods. If you look at each column, each one has a separate. So this is wide data. This is kind of challenging to work with inside of Excel, and often we have to fix it by pivoting it back. So here's a better example. This is what's called tall data. So now instead of going to the right, like our prior one did here, now we go vertical. So now our black inductor has product category one, product category two, but you notice that B and D shows up multiple times. Data in this sort of tall format is so much easier to work with because it lets us do filtering, sorting, um, data visualizations, everything just gets a lot easier. So if you start with data in this format, you have to get it back into the format that we're looking at here. Standardizing. All right, how do we clean up our data? Now, there's some reasons we have to standardize. We might have a couple different sources. So maybe in one system, record things in quarters. Another system, record things in month. We might need a common format or coding. So maybe some departments use names one way. Some departments use it another way. And we're making sure that it's all useful and stuff's in the right field. So how does this work? Well. Two ideas are parsing and concatenation. These are kind of the opposite of each other. Parsing means we split a field apart. So we start with one field, and we go to multiple fields. Concatenation is the opposite. We go from two fields down to 
a single field. Look at some examples here. So for our parsing example, we have our original column on the left, and this has a lot of information. We have 210, in other words, we're going to give a 2% discount if it's within 10 days, and then the net payment is due in 30 days. This information is a lot easier to work with if we have it split out. So we have our discount rate in one column, discount days in a second column, and balance due in a third column. So parsing means I split this up. We also might need to concatenate. Concatenate means I'm going to combine it together. So I have on my left here my original columns with two fields. And on the right, we have it all in one field. So you might think, OK, well, why do I need to concatenate stuff? Well, sometimes we, we want things a little more concise of a format. Often what you'll end up doing as well is you'll grab one piece of a field. Perhaps maybe you'll just grab like the first initial and then combine that with the last name. Other parts of data standardization are fixing problems with our data. So sometimes we give these different terms like cryptic, right? They misfielded, consist inconsistent. And basically, it's all gets down to the idea of cleaning up the data to have what we expect to, be, to find. So with cleaning um, anything that's inconsistent or incomplete, we have to go through and fix it. So what do these look like? Uh, well, one thing that you might see is when there's a zero or one for a variable, this is actually really handy. We call it a dummy variable. Basically, one means yes and zero means no. So to go back to our point of sale example, you might say, is this person part of our discount club? If so, it will be a one. If not, it will be zero. And as we get further on in the class, you'll see how this gets really useful. You might also need to deduplicate. Perhaps we have someone that lost their card at a certain point in time and got a new card. But we really want to combine their records together to show that they are one consistent customer. So you might need to deduplicate or take multiple rows and combine them together. We also need to filter out. Perhaps you don't want to see anyone who is also an employee, for example. So that's part of filtering. Imputation. Imputation is the idea of basically guessing. We're saying that we don't have information on someone. So how do we deal with that? Well, a lot of times you don't want to leave an empty value when you're doing certain statistical techniques or aggregation. So what you might end up doing is basically averaging out a field and sticking that average into anyone that you don't know of. Say, for example, you're looking at people's income. You're trying to do some kind of report off of that. Well, if you're looking at all of the data entry clerks, they probably are fairly consistent across that sort of job and salary bracket. So you might, if you're missing a couple of people's salary, just go ahead and throw in there the average salary for that particular job role. We might also have contradictions. This is information that doesn't seem to match. So say, for example, our data entry clerk has a salary that's four times what it should be. Well, there's probably something wrong with their title in there or something wrong with their salary in there. We might also have threshold violations. This basically says I set minimum and maximum on fields and notice when things come out of that area. So say, for example, we have an age field for our operator and that's a negative value. Well, obviously that's an error. Or it could be I've got a value that is, instead of saying you know, they're 23 or 24 years old, instead I have a year, like you know, 2002. So that's obviously an error, and we should write our column so that we don't end up with that coming through into our analysis code, because that's going to mess up my graph and my statistics. Now this one here, a violated attribute dependencies, kind of sounds a little bit wonky and a little bit complex. But basically, it just gets at the idea of keys. The keys don't seem to match properly. And we'll talk about this more when we get into our database entry type. A lot of these errors are basically data entry errors. On average, human beings have a 2 to 3% error rate whenever they're working on something. And so you should sort of just assume that if you've got people typing stuff in, there's going to be problems with it. And that's why we need to have this validation process. It's going to start by pretty informally just scrolling through a bunch of data. And just scroll through and look and see if you find anything. Now, at a certain point, you've got too much data to actually see all of it. So then you also do techniques like using pivot tables to look for weird values. Um, you'll find other ways of doing it as well. But start off just by looking informally through the data, and then basically go through each column and try to decide what should be in this column. What are the limits? What are the values? What are missed keys? All that kind of stuff. So here's an example of how to walk through the process. First, visual inspection. Just scroll through your Excel spreadsheet. 
Next, you can do some basic stats tests. A lot of things in the real world have what's called a normal curve. So a normal curve means we have a median value in the middle, one quartile, third quartile, and then the distance between sort of fits certain statistical properties, like standard deviation, that kind of thing. So a lot of stuff kind of fits this normal curve. Now, this is not a very beautiful normal curve because I'm writing with my mouse, but it gets the idea that you can do certain stats tests. And so if you end up with a value that's all the way out here, you can say, maybe there's a problem with that. I'm also going to audit a sample. So I'm going to take a couple of rows randomly throughout my data set and then try and follow that back to the root data and see, does this match and does, it, does this connect properly? So we can go two directions here, and both of them are valuable. So tracing. Tracing says I start with my source document, say, for example, an invoice, and I'm going to trace it to my accounting records. And you can think of tracing as like you're firing a gun and there's like these lighted bullets, tracers coming out. If you've ever seen some like old war movies, they'll show a machine gun, you can see bullets flying out. Those are tracers, right? Tracers are looking in front of the gun and seeing where it goes. This will find problems when you have an invoice that wasn't input into the system. The other direction is called vouching. Vouching goes the other way or backwards. This goes from your accounting records to the source documents. And you need to have both of these. If you don't trace and you've lost an invoice, you won't know. For vouching, we want to go backwards from accounting to invoice to make sure that everything follows along and that there's not things in our accounting records that we don't have records for or source documents. So basically, did we make up a sale? Well, vouching will figure out if you made up a sale. Did you lose a sale? Well, Trace will find out if you lost a sale. So hopefully this chapter gave you some good ideas on how to transform data and get it into a format that's easier to analyze.